that's a beautiful song. Um, now, that is the sort of song that would get people calling you an old soul, which you disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, I don't know if I disagree with it anymore. I sort of, um, yeah, I can, I can put on that hat if I feel like it. <laughs> you're, not so, you're not as reluctant as maybe you were before to take that on? Yeah, yeah. maybe I feel like I'm older now. I, there was an interview um, that I read of yours that I loved. You were talking about old kinds of knowledge and mysticism mm -hmm. and your renewed in your interest in that stuff. Where did that come from? I don't I don't know. I can't point pinpoint exactly, but I think um I think there's a lot of that in in like just Europe and and ancient culture. Um and I think I missed that so much when I lived in California, and then there's a whole different type of mysticism that's going, that happens there. <laughs> you talked about the yoga mysticism, yeah. is oh, that what yeah. you meant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you talked really passionately about connecting with nature and sort of the loss of our understanding of ourselves as belonging to nature. Mm -hmm. What makes you really passionate about that? I, I don't, well, yeah, I think there's a, there's a natural morality that's given to us with, a, with an observance of nature and that's taken away from us with a, an observance to, um, you know, like um, constructed ritual, sort of man-made ritual and, and idolatry. But um, I don't claim to have any um, definite answers to anything. Yeah. But that's that's my current thinking. It's, it's, it's interesting how quickly being around natural and um, we're an expression of something natural and so is the city to some extent yeah so um there's logic to everything and therefore there's morality to everything that we have an ability to observe if we are looking for it maybe and you're passionate about us potentially losing that yes knowledge. yeah there's a great quote from a robertson davis book he's canadian Mm -hmm. Well done, you guys. Um, <laughs> about how um, it's so important for us to learn all the sort of the tricks of the of 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 old. You know, I think the thing that he's talking about in particular is how we used to be able to put our ears to the ground and be able to hear an army marching from miles away, and and there's some things that would be worth knowing before all, um, mm -hmm. before people even know something's lost. You know, that's the really scary thing. Mm -hmm. But then I've spent a lot of my life, my adult life, being a bit of a, like a self-imposed luddite, and okay. I actually think there's a lot of like promise now and and promise and brightness in the evolution of mankind and technology. And so, yeah. You said that particular book came into your life at exactly the right time. Why? Yeah. Um, I think I was like eighteen or nineteen when I read that book, and I was, um, or when I discovered Robertson Davies, and then I constantly read everything that he'd done. Because um, he does brilliantly, he he brings mis the, the mystical and, and the real together really beautifully, and he uses such beautiful language. And he's just like a he was just like a brilliant eccentric, you know, mm. makes life interesting. Nice. Um, I want to get into this album. Um, it's the product of an important period in your life. After a decade of doing music full time, um, you had kind of an existential crisis. Yes. What happened? Yeah. I just sort of lost the the passion a bit. Um, or I guess now I look back, I sort of lost the muse, which I wouldn't have ever, I wouldn't dare to have like attributed my ability to write songs to something other than me. But I think that's what happened. I sort of lost touch with the muse. And so, and I began to sort of put a lot of moral, um, um, mora morality seems to be a common theme, um, uh, I sort of wasn't, I didn't feel like being a musician was fulfilling my sort of quota of human g goodness, you know, just felt like it was not, um, it was not doing any good for the planet, which is a lot to put on. It's <laughs> a lot to put on <laughs> yourself. Like, yeah. So I think that was obviously a symptom of some other um, psychological problem, which was resolved in the time that I eventually took out. But um, I don't. I, I don't think it's an uncommon crisis. At mm. the same time, for artists, yeah. How did you resolve that? Well, I'm sort of in the. I just decided to resolve it, and I'm sort of still in the process of doing that. Yeah. And short movie was kind of a product of that. Short movie is a bit of like the middle of a thought rather than the conclusion. Yeah. Um, and I think that's sort of you can tell that from listening to it. But um, yeah. 
What were you hoping to gain from your time away from music? I think I, I was trying to claw back a bit of my adolescence, which I didn't feel deprived of, but um, but I did. I left home and started touring when I was 16 and, you know, I didn't get any of my qualifications, my academic qualifications. And so I just took time to, to do, to learn things and to get a real job and, like, meet meet people. It, just, it had just got to a point in London where it was sort of not possible for me to meet someone without somebody whose girlfriend liked my music or something. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But I wanted to just make sure I'd figured myself out a bit more before that became a common thing. What sorts of things did you do in an effort to do that? I did a lot of not telling people I was a musician and seeing how much they liked me without that. <laughs> Which is interesting. Um, <laughs> what did that reveal? <laughs> well, it just, you know, it didn't, you know, thankfully people do like me even though I'm not a musician. Um, but, you know, I did have to work a bit harder. You know, there's no two ways about it. Yeah. And I'm glad I've seen that reality. Um, because, you know, who you are is part, what you do, sorry, is part of your persona. And I I kind of cl like cleared my entire, cleared this whole massive space in my persona and didn't fill it with anything. So it was like when people would say, what do you do? Or what have you been doing? I'd be like, oh. <laughs> I don't know. So you just sort of... You didn't think of a backstory. No, I didn't know. And I'm no use to lying either, so I couldn't have done it. How did the people close to you react when you said you want to step away from music? I don't think I told that many people. I just sort of went. Um, I, was, I, like, I literally just sort of woke up one morning and I was living in LA and I didn't really know how it had happened. And then I, I sort of just didn't... I guess I just didn't go home again mm. after a tour. And... I think people understood that I needed a break or a sabbatical or something. And I, I'd been hitting it pretty hard. I toured a year by myself in a car. And it had been an amazing year and it had like done everything I wanted it to do, just sort of given me the opportunity to understand how everything works and what it feels like to be, to like work, you know, really work hard for what you're doing. And, and so I felt good about everything and I felt it was like a good time to just see where I was at as just a human. My producer made an interesting observation. He said, most people turn to music when they want to cope with this sort of existential crisis. Mm. That was precisely the thing you had to set aside. Yeah. Well, it can be, I guess, music can be this sort of self-perpetuating story that you're telling yourself. And I had just had, you know, Once I Was an Eagle, which is the album that I'm most proud of, I'm sorry, short movie. It's great. <laughs> short movie's great too. Um, <laughs> but th this album that came out before um, short movie, I, I felt like I really needed to give that the time and space that it it, it wanted from me or something because I think that was a weird album to write to write because a lot of it I sort of wrote and it came from somewhere that I didn't realise that was I, I I'm not in control of, and I wanted to like figure out what that is before I started writing another album again because. I don't want my sort of subconscious running wild. Mm. That's like, that's not, um, that's not a responsible human thing to do. Why not? Well, I guess, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out, but I guess that is like the point of art, isn't it? To sort of let your subconscious run wild and see if it can latch onto something and be understood. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess like the whole point of being, of being creative is to be understood somehow. And like, that's why people like things because it makes them feel understood. I guess I was just trying to understand fundamentally myself yeah. first. Well, again, back uh, back to the question of morality, I guess. Mm. You can probably feel more secure putting something out into the world that you understand. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then I feel like that's, a respon that's my responsibility, at least, because, um, you know... I'll sing to, you know, in some countries I'll sing to 50 people in the night and others I'll sing to 2,000. And I want people to go away feeling understood, you know, and better. And my songs can be a bit sad, you know. And I don't think that, like, sadness is, a, is, is not a valid human emotion. Yeah. But I would like people to go away not feeling sad. <laughs> it's the really simple thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. So then the responsibility is... I guess, yeah, l let me have my head around my intention with these sad songs. Exactly, yeah, yeah the intention. Yeah. Um, there was a moment in your journey where you met a shaman. 
Yes. In Mount Shasta. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, it wouldn't be a trip to California without meeting a shaman. Um, but this was quite early on in my year of touring by myself. This was before I lived in California. And he, he was just like this sweet old hippie who I, I met in this little town. And I, I, I just got to the point, I think it was like three weeks into this run, and I had just got to the point where I was like, yeah, I could do with the chat. I could do with talking to somebody. And like a real chat. A real chat. Yeah. Preferably not about gear or, you know, <laughs> guitars or whatever. And um, And he just sort of bounded up to me and started talking about how he'd seen Bigfoot a couple of days earlier in the mountains. I was like, oh, cool. Um, and I, and then um, he was just telling me about it. It's like so, it's so far, it's like the least English person I'd ever met. And he uh, was telling me about like how he plays flute in this transcendental band and um, he's a shaman for some sort of ceremony that I didn't, I'd never heard of. And he was just a really sweet person and like, um, and he he was the one who kept saying it's a short movie it's a short movie you got to you know you got to do it today or something you know so he said that there was this mouth of this river at the base of mount chester that i had to go to cuz it gave like life giving it was like life giving water and so he'd like pump me up and and like prep me for like it's a short movie you've got to take every opportunity you can so he gave me these details of where this river was and the next morning i drove there at like 5 in the morning cuz i had to get I had to drive really far that day and I found myself in the middle of the woods at the base of the mountain, um, like on the direction given to me by a total stranger in the dark who said he'd seen Bigfoot the day before. <laughs> and I like, it was the most, <laughs> it was probably the most stupid I've ever felt. But I did get the water and it was great. And and that phrase obviously resonated with you. Yeah. You made it the title of your album. Mm-hmm. Why did it resonate for you? I think like, I just like, all my Englishness loved the sort of cheesiness of the simplicity of a phrase like that. Yeah. And I think I needed it a bit. I needed that kind of thought. Or we needed to embrace that, like, sincerity a bit. Do you ever watch the show 30 Rock? Yes. One of my favorite quotes from that show, uh, Jack says to Liz, never go with a hippie to a second location. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so good. But you can uh, come away with a nice album title if you do. So yeah. uh, Jack Donaghy does not know all. Um, how does it feel to come back to music? How did it feel? It felt really good. I felt like very, I felt like it gave me the time to be really grateful for what I do, which I, I know how lucky I am to be doing what I'm doing, but I think I needed to be really grateful for it. And it's changed my attitude, you know, and in a good way. And um, and I'm I'm very happy, I'm very happy doing what I do. And this is the first album you've produced, is that right? Yeah, yeah. This is well, it was a co-production with um, my drummer Matt and uh, our engineer Dan, and that was great. It was nice to do do it quietly. Was that partly a product of your time away too? That confidence to produce? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think like you know, I just did take a bit of a step up in confidence, like sort of self-confidence, um, because I had the time to get, well, because I was like, you know, paying bills in a different country. I felt like a boss. Um, <laughs> felt like a real grown-up. So, yeah, it was good. What about writing and writing and recording again, coming back to the studio, mm. where you you grew up in the studio? Yeah. Yeah. What was it like coming back to the studio environment? Um, for this record? Yeah. It was lovely. I mean, it, I feel very comfortable in studios um, and they're like, um, you know, a mecca of distraction and learning and like there's just endless, endless things to do and learn. And, and when I came to writing, I mean, I wrote while I was living in L.A. still not being involved in music. Um, and there is this kind of like this now I listened to the album I had to listen to it this week because our guitarist didn't make it in the country so we've been going back and looking over all the songs trying to figure out how we're going to play them just as a three piece mm. and I hadn't listened to the record really since we made it and I was like it's 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 like it's like it's a I don't know, I don't want to like undersell it, but it's like it, I can hear that I was so not sure of anything as I was writing it. You know, I, I didn't know how it was going to come together and yeah. it feels like there's like another bit that's still to come, maybe. Well, you described it uh, at the outset as like halfway through a thought, mm. not a complete thought. Yeah. Are you starting to see the other side of that 
that? Yeah, definitely. They're sort of making itself clear to me again. Yeah. I think it's such an interesting point in an artist's output as well when they can sort of look at their catalogue and say, make those kinds of judgments that mm. feel like they're underselling. Yeah, yeah, how, yeah. How does that feel for you to well, be I at that point? It's nice. You know, it's yeah. nice because I guess like this is, that was my fifth record and in eight years and... I love making records the way that I wait them, um, wait them, make them, because sometimes because I feel like I, I make records in two weeks uh, in I, actually in the studio and 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 write them in six months or something and and then just get them down in two weeks, and I love that because it's like it's my way of writing these little short novels or something, you know, and it just gets them done and they are what they are. And then this was the first one where <laughs> that was like you know I <laughs> this is an awful thing to confess, but. Once when it was an eagle was my fourth record, and I was like, oh, I don't think I'm ever going to better that one, and I don't think that this one's better than that one. You know, I hate to talk about it's like talking about your children in a terrible way or something. I think this one's really good. I've heard a lot of mature parents talk about their kids that way, though, yeah. at the same time, right? That's dark. <laughs> that's so dark. Yeah, so no, I, I do think that's a very interesting point. Every artist reaches that point in their career. Well, you got to, yeah, yeah. You can't just keep getting better. Oh, but it's it's it is different though. You know, there's yeah. there's there are moments, right, in your life and, and in your creative life. Um do you think you'll continue building these sort of creative breaks into your life and into your process? Yeah, I think so. I think there's I think there's quite a famous businessman who does that, who like takes his whole company off and gives them six months off every seven years or something. Hmm. I think that's really smart. Because you need to like find other interests and otherwise you're just sort of perpetuating everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for sharing all this today. It was a real pleasure. Uh, and you have one more tune for us. Yes, I do, yeah. Uh, what song is it? It's called How Can I? <laughs> 